business. That's his business. His business model. I borrowed it. Is everybody ready? Lori, are you ready? <coughs> are we ready? Okay. Welcome you all to the Milton City Hall. And I'm going to open the meeting of the Milton Common Council for December 3rd, 2019 to order. And the first item on the agenda is roll call. Ramsey? Here. Sullivan? Here. Nelson? Here. Boone? Here. Zard? Here. West? Present. Olson. Here. Present. Present. Okay. In favor of. Okay. She's the one to speak. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We are now. We got this one too. Yep. Yep. <coughs> So um, I'm going to open the comments section from the citizens present. It's limited to three minutes per speaker, and Larry's going to keep track of the time. And uh, um, I'm going to start with uh, Rose Syme first. You'll see. Good evening, and thank you for letting me speak. My name is Rose Syme. I live at 6327 Elmwood Avenue here in Middleton, and I'm pleased to speak, you as a li speak to you as a library trustee on our Middleton Library. Um, I'm, sh I'm hoping that mm, you've all been into the library and seen the wonderful changes that have been coming about in the library over this last year. And um, it has had an extremely successful year. 2019 has focused on the next chapter improvements with three major goals in mind. To improve customer service, to create flexible spaces for new ways of gathering, and to increase the square footage available to the public. If you were here for the tree lighting and all the events that were going on that, that whole afternoon and evening, you would have seen how well used the um, library was with that one new area off to the right as you go in past the desk, which is now out in the middle, it was just full of young people and older people. And, um, and then off to the left when you first come in, there were people sitting in that new wonderful area with the orange carpeting. I mean, it's so colorful in there right now. It's just lovely to be in the library. But so you'll see that the, the improvement to the customer service is incredible. Also, that they created the flexible space, which allows for that gathering. And then we are trying to increase the square footage because there has been a study showing that we do not have enough f square footage for all the use that, that the library gets. So in collaboration with the local firm HGA and Milwaukee-based BSI, the facility has gone through six phases of work, including painting, new flooring in the entry and archer meeting rooms, additional mo mobile shelving, which can be moved. Mobile obviously means mobile. And so that, you know, when we want to have a large area, we can have that. And there's been some furniture replacement, and hopefully there will be more. While these minimal improvements have all been aesthetic, the impact has been tremendous. Um, I spoke to people as they came in that day, as a, I had my little tri library trustee pin and, and was able to speak to people and ask them what they thought about the changes and, and overwhelmingly it was positive. The biggest changes have been for the staff. In consolidating three points of service down to two, we have met all three goals and continued to update and simplify the library's staffing model to meet patrons' needs. The staff and trustees truly appreciate the public patience and we continue to offer full service throughout the work. While progress has been made, there's still lots of work to be done to meet our immediate needs. The $500,000 Next Chapter Project budget has used no additional capital funds nor taxpayer dollars. Using existing library funds of $300,000 and setting a fundraising goal of $200,000, the remaining improvements are dependent upon the generosity and the support of our community. These impacts will be seen throughout the building with things like technology upgrades, 
materials that support early literacy, and spaces that showcase, celebrate, and share experiences through art. It's been an exciting time. I'm new on the board, but it's been exciting to see these changes come about, and I hope that you will think about contributing to that, and I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Rose. And the next one is Robert Buck. <clears throat> Let me raise that. Hello, I'm Robert Burke. I am um, a resident here in the city of Middleton, U, uh, 7418 Voss Parkway. You know me as an alder, but I'm here tonight um, wearing a different cap. I'm right now the um, president of the board of trustees of the Middleton Public Library. So to continue on with what Rose just told you, um, today I think you guys probably have seen one or two internet things saying that today is Giving Tuesday. Um, the Library Board of Trustees invites the council, the audience, and of course our substantial and vast uh, web audience that I'm sure watches this um, after our meeting is over, uh, to join us in helping the, the library reach its fundraising goals. Uh, as was stated before by Rose, uh, the budget for this project to kind of renew, refresh, get the library up to a, a more usable place has been going well. They're doing this all without city funding um, toward this project, and uh, they paid $300,000 out of the funds that they had for their budget. They need to raise $200,000 extra. They've gotten $100,000 toward that $200,000 goal. So they're halfway there, and that is fantastic. But we want to welcome everyone to, to give if, if you know, they find benefit in the public library. Um, as we close out 2019 and are happy to share, um, a little bit of new information is that we had f uh, nine naming rights within the library, and we've gotten five different groups to take up, take us up on that. So we're more than halfway done with uh, naming rights for certain rooms and portions of the library. Still four more for those who are interested in, in uh, getting naming rights for portions of the library. Um, we'd love that. We have the help of over 200 individuals in our fundraising goal to date, so we're halfway there. And with your help, we can go even further. Um, with the next chapter project. Thank you for your time. We look forward to sharing um, more with you um, as we, as we uh, accomplish our goals and uh, really improve the library uh, more than where we are today. I see a question. To whom should someone write a check if they are inclined to donate? I would ask them to write the check to the uh, Middleton Public Library specifically. Um, uh, we can figure out that there's, there's an endowment fund, but uh, specifically this is going toward next chapter. So we would, um, if I can find out exactly uh, what that answer is after the meeting, apparently. Middleton Public Library and next chapter. So I'm going to get started here. Oh, wow. Great job. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we're now over. We're now over 50%. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you all. Okay, so the next one is Jim Alev. He's going to speak. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Jim Eiliff. I live at 3100 Nightingale Lane in Middleton. And I'm here to speak uh, in favor of the, the two affordable housing projects that are on your agenda, the rezoning of the Sonic site for University Avenue Flats and uh, J.T. Klein's request for uh, TIF funding to, to fund the affordable units in Tribeca. As we heard, both of these uh, projects in, uh, contain a workforce housing that we urgently need in order to fulfill uh, our target uh, um, numbers. And, and we've learned tonight that the target is even a little further away, so that makes these units even more important. Our city does indeed have many benefits, but many of those benefits are unavailable to folks who would like to live and work here but are unable to do so. 
Um, this is both a, a residential, but it's also a, a business issue. I heard a, a Middleton business owner speak at a, a, the Dane County Housing Summit a couple years ago about how she was unable to grow her business because she was unable to uh, attract and keep employees because they often had to live in communities at a distance and then had to drive. And we all know what that means in December, January, February, and even this year in October. Um, the <coughs> Middleton Chamber of Commerce has come out in favor of workforce housing, and that ought to tell you that they see this as an urgent need for themselves. Uh, the the uh, University uh, Avenue flat site uh, should be able to accommodate the four-story building that they're requesting. The land slopes uh, slopes up uh, on to the south on the on the back side of their building, and there's a screen of trees, so it should uh, have minimal impact on the communities, uh, the neighborhoods behind. Also, the uh, the sun will cast the shadow on University Avenue and not on people's backyards. Um, the the site out in Tribeca, I think, is is also a, an excellent one where. Uh, there would be a lot of space for a lot of units, and I would want to uh, want to encourage you to support uh, uh, J uh, Jacob's request for that as well. There are many things that we can uh, be proud of and be thankful for in Middleton, and I would like to urge you to help make those things more available to more people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. And the next one is Betsy Day. Hi, thank you. My name is Betsy Day, and I live at 6429 Maywood Avenue, and I'm here um, speaking as a member of Voices in Favor, which is a small and developing group of folks that uh, really want to make sure that this is a community for all people. Um, last week at the planning board meeting, um, there was a lot of, uh, well, there was a speaker who was concerned about the types of people that uh, affordable housing might bring to our um, fair city. And I just wanted to throw out a few, a few numbers because, um, and like he said last week at that meeting, well, I work for a living and I didn't have that much time to throw these numbers together, so I kind of um, put, uh, it did a quick internet search, and some of the numbers might be a little bit off, but according to my, um, what I found, the area median income, or AMI, here is about 72, a little bit more than 72,000. Um, so looking at the housing that's going to be provided, workforce housing is defined as housing, um, that is affordable for people making 60% or less of the uh, area media income, median income. So I wanted to look at a cup, just a couple of our um, community members and the types of jobs they have. Uh, for instance, starting salary for a teacher, um, I found at 35,000, so that's about 49% of the area media median income. So they would need affordable housing. Um, maybe the, the middle range of that would be 47,000. That's 65% of the area media income, <coughs> median income. And even a police officer, um, I found a number of uh, 50,000 um, 700 as an average. I don't know how accurate that is, but um, that's about 70% of the area median income. So um, I just wanted to speak in favor of, first of all, we have a less than 2% vacancy rate um, for housing, so we need more housing. And given what people make these days, we need more housing that's affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. So there are three other people who support this housing development on Sonic property. That's Rose Syme. And uh, 
and or and uh, beer Meyer, she would like the ordinance rezoning at 6318 University Avenue as well. And then Roger Hansen would also like that uh, um, the zoning ordinance for the affordable housing to be approved. Anybody else who might want to speak? Anybody else who might want to speak? Okay, we are going to close that part of the public hearing and move on to the approval of the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Now we are on to a very important part of the meeting today. That is honoring Chief Charles Folk for his service to the city of Middleton. And before I start with the proclamation, I want to say I got to know the chief about uh, 2008, and uh, he was a lieutenant at the time, which I was trying to learn how to pronounce. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so he did such a great job, then he retired. And imagine this, that after he retired, he was so outstanding, just I think, I don't know, after a few weeks or a few days, he was rehired as a captain, which was much easier to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the public safety for the city is a very high priority, and Chuck, Chief Chuck has done it simply, and, and the police department, he's, he has created values and the attitude for, the, for our whole department that it's very important, and they are doing an outstanding job. And now on to the proclamation. Great job, Chuck. Proclamation honoring Police Chief Charles Folk's service to the city of Milton and declaring Friday, December 13th, as Chuck Folk Day in Middleton. That's when he's stepping down and going on his big vacation. So, <laughs> whereas Chuck Folk has announced his retirement as the chief of police with the Middleton Police Department after serving since July 1st, 1981. We moved here in 1982, so he was already there. So mm -hmm. some 38 plus years of public service to the city of Milton as a sworn police officer. And whereas Chuck was an intern with the city of Milton Police Department in the summer of 1980 and later was hired as a part-time dispatcher for the police department prior to becoming a sworn police officer with a starting wage of $4.35 an hour. If you want to stand up, maybe if you, if you don't mind, you can, yeah. <laughs> it's good that uh, he wouldn't have been able to afford a house at that salary, <laughs> but, <it's, laughs> but things much, went much better for him. Whereas Chuck has served superbly the, well, where Chuck has served the residents of the city of Milton with the highest distinction, always going above and beyond the call of duty for the needs of the community. And whereas Chuck has served superbly in the position of patrol officer, school resource officer, juvenile detective, detective, patrol sergeant, detective sergeant, Lieutenant, field services captain, and the chief of police. I didn't know there were all those patients. Boy, he has uh, covered all of those. So, And whereas Chuck is a proud graduate of the FBI National Academy, session 228, and has attended other prestigious training throughout his career as a police officer. And whereas Chuck is well known throughout the police department for his sense of humor and is known for his famous saying of tip top, stood up up. 
maybe not the, this is not the way he says that. <laughs> finer than the frog's hair. <laughs> Do you want to say it? Tip top, soda pop. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Jack has been an extraordinary leader and has helped guide the police department through some difficult times, such as the historic flood and active shooter events in 2018, and the passing of our beloved co-worker, Katie Barrios, in 2019. And whereas Chuck cares about the well-being of police department employees and the members of the community with which he comes in contact. And whereas Chuck has been very involved in the law enforcement profession, including as a member of the Wisconsin Chief of Police Association, the Dane County Chief of Police Police Association, including past president, and as a strong leader and voice on the law enforcement and leaders of color collaboration efforts over the past few years. And whereas Chuck is very involved in the community, serving as a member and past president of Milton Kiwanis Club, a citizen member of the Commission on Youth and delivering food for meals on wheels through our local senior center among his many other contributions. And whereas Chief Charles Folk has excelled in all facets of his work with the city and he will be missed both personally and professionally by the staff, city employees, elected officials, and members of the community. And now, therefore, I hereby proclaim, honor, commend Chuck Folk for his highly distinguished career of public service to the city and declare Friday, December 13, Chuck Folk Day in Middleton. We wish Chuck pleasant, healthy, and prosperous retirement with his wife, wonderful wife, Robin. This proclamation was adopted at a regular meeting of the Milton Common Council on the third day of December 2019. Need a motion. Emily, you want to make? I'll make a motion. Need a second? Second. Okay. Second. All right. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Wow. <laughs> Imagine this. This is amazing. Chief Polk has done an amazing job for this city for 38 years, and we are very grateful. Thank, thank you, Mayor. You, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. May I say a quick word? Yes, yes please. Well, it will be quick because um, Mike promised to take me out for a beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I want to get this meeting over with. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm not good at accepting praise. And um, that really became apparent after the Paradigm event when people come up to me and say, you did a great job, and I didn't do a great job. We did a great job. And by we, I, I encompass a lot of different people and groups in that. But finally, my wife Robin said, Chuck, when somebody thanks you or compliments you, simply thank them back. So thank you. <laughs> um, also, I have been going home and telling my wife, Robin, when I did something like for the last time, like I went to my last in service, or I qualified for the last time. And some of those were, I was glad it was the last time, and you know, some, I felt a little bit bad about it, but um, so today are two last times. I delivered Meals on Wheels for the last time, and um, my last council meeting. I got yelled at today, delivering Meals on Wheels. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little late. <laughs> uh, really, I did it. She, she <laughs> said, you're late. <laughs> well, I was. And, uh, so my goal tonight is not to get yelled at. So again, thank you. I'd, I'd like to say a few words, too. On behalf of the staff, uh, I know there will be a lot of tears shed when Chuck finally walks out that door. He's been a great colleague and friend and uh, leader of the community, and uh, he just means so much to the staff 
and I know to all of you, and uh, community members. They talk a lot about what an absolute benefit Chuck has brought to the community. His leadership, his compassion, his sense of humor, uh, his willingness to go above and beyond the call of duty on a regular basis. So he's an inspiration and uh, someone who I, I'd say I've never had a better colleague in public service than Chuck Folk. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. What an amazing guy. So we are going to go to the item number one under ordinances. Agreement. And uh, I'm going here. So. Oh, you want to jump? Okay. Yes, we are just going to, just for today, we're going to jump to the ordinance rezoning 6413 University Avenue from B due to PDD GIP for University Flats residential project. I, I make a motion. To approve. Second. Thank you. Okay, any questions or comments? Are you suspending the. Uh, yeah, you, you're going to suspend the second reading, right? Yes, I'm okay. Sorry. I'd like to suspend the second reading and go ahead with it. Okay. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, guys. Great job. So it's going to move forward now. So really appreciate that. Okay. We are back to the agreements now. And item number one, agreement with Badger Bus Lines for trolley bus service from 2020 to 2022. Move approval. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Item number two, storm water management system maintenance agreement with the Ostringer Capital Group, the Eddy 6318 University Avenue. Move approval. Need a second? Did I I'll have a second? second? I'll okay. Second it. Uh, any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. We are on to item number three, intergovernmental agreement to fund a position responsible for stormwater information, education, and outreach coordination for the MAMSWAP. Move approval is recommended by finance. Second. Any questions or comments? This is the one of the positions supported by many different communities. So does Mike or anybody know how do we use, do we get that data and how do we use it? I don't know that it's data so much as information. We're trying to keep spreading the word in different ways. Susan has her hand up, and I yield the floor to Susan. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead and finish, then we can ask Susan, so. No, that's cool. Yeah. Man okay. Swap is working with all these municipalities on many, many different ways of reducing pollution, specifically phosphorus. Mm -hmm. It's going into, actually, the Rock River, which the sewer plant dumps all their effluent into. And we actually end up paying less in sewer charges if we can reduce the amount of phosphorus going into the Rock River. So this... Uh, so it's getting people to work in all sorts of ways throughout the county. So keeping your leaves sweeped up and out of the <coughs> curbs is a way of reducing phosphorus. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, so Anything? they've run various campaigns, giveaways, those kinds of things, just to remind people, you know, what, what information is available and how they can improve stormwater quality without leaving their own front yard. Uh, you know, so There's this is education and outreach. Education. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, the motion is to approve the intergovernmental agreement to fund a position for MEM swap, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. 
We are on to now appointment of election inspectors for 2020-21 term. City clerk. Move approval. Second. Lori, you want to add anything? Or that's it. So, okay. All those in favor of the motion to approve the election inspectors, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We're unanimous. So we already passed next one. We are now, now to item number two: ordinance to amend section 9.0510 D1A and B of the City of Milton General Ordinances relating to quarterly service charge for the sewer. This is about the sewer rates, and you got to suspend the rules. A, I'll move approval. Uh, also, suspending the rules to for approval right away. <laughs> Okay. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> to suspend the second reading, so. Okay, second? Emily, you second. Okay. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Now, this is ordinance to amend section 3.12 for fee schedule of the City of Milton Code of Ordinances relating to the dog license fees. I would move we suspend the rules and approve. Back second. Okay, any questions or comments? The dog license fee is going up from $20, $25. Okay, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Now we are on to the ordinances, second reading. Ordinance to create an appeals process for address change determinations. And this is the second readings, and that will be final. I move approval of the second reading. Second. Okay, any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Oh. Why? There's something. Yeah. This ordinance was supposed to be corrected after the first reading, and it looks like it wasn't. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's supposed to say uh, section 8.10 sub 2 of the Middleton Municipal Code is hereby amended to read as follows. And if we can go back and do that again, that would be right after the Common Council of the City of Middleton hereby ordain as follows okay it doesn't say what it's amending so okay so what do you want me to do here now well could we yeah, you, we can we can do it right now I mean it we can we can reconsider it. okay I assume everyone agrees that we want to do this okay so do you okay you want to reconsider that motion more? with with the, the corrections oh. no first you have I to reconsider, reconsider it first, it oh. first. okay okay so we, we need okay. a se okay and all those in favor of the reconsideration of the motion we just passed, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passed unanimously. Okay, so how do you want that motion to be now? Okay, the, the ordinance, um, what, we're, what we're adding is a line after the Common Council of the City of Middleton do hereby ordain as follows. And the words that we are adding, it's not actually part of the ordinance, but it's essential to the understanding of the ordinance, is section 8.10 sub 2 of the Middleton Municipal Code is hereby amended to read as follows, colon, and then the text follows. Okay, so Emily, you want to make that motion then? As uh, stated by, mm, Me. by yes, Larry? Yes, I so. will make that motion. Okay, so need a second. I will second. Okay, so this is the motion as stated by Larry and yes, Mike. And we do have that. It was provided by the city attorney last time we hand, handed it out to all the council. So you saw it. It's just not in the packet this time. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Any other questions or comments? Larry, you have any more comments? No. Nope. Okay. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Re recommendations and proposals. Concept review for tax incremental district five assistance. JT Klein for 3810 and Tribeca. Blue approval is recommended by finance, which was the 80% at 3.270. Need a second? I would like to submit an alternative motion to approve at 90%. <coughs> yeah. 
Okay, so well, first we need a second. I'll second. Fund. I'll second the uh, Susan's motion. No, do we do we not need the? He made the motion first. That has to be seconded first, right? I thought it was the original motion. So Kathy, yeah, you second seconded that yeah. motion. Yeah. Okay, so now she's making an alternate motion, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And she can. Okay, and that's seconded as which, well. Which then is on the table. Okay. Okay. So the. Ninety percent is on the table. The second, well, the alternate motion is on the Correct. on the table. Okay, so any discussion now? So, yes. Okay. Um, for the benefit of everybody, could someone explain or help define um, developer? <coughs> how is it? Developer. Developer finance. Finance. Versus, financed, yeah. Yeah. Well, how about if you do it, any. or Mike? <laughs> well, I, I think Bill is. Uh, for everybody. Okay, you both can do right. it. So when the developer finances it, the uh, developer takes out the loan. The city creates an obligation through the resolution that you pass to commit TIF up to a certain percent. So whether it's fifty percent, eighty percent, ninety percent of the tax increment created by that development to go back to the developer. So he pays it. And then we, in effect, pay the developer back based on our agreement to cover his loan. When the developer takes out the loan, there is practically no risk to the city. If the city lends the money directly, then the risk is on the city. So in recent years, we've gone more to the model of developer finance simply because the risk is less to the city and put on the developer. And so, you've left out the most important part, which is the, the amount of assistance we pay back, regardless of the percentage, is based on the assessed value of the project. And if this, this project calls for two buildings, for example, if only one is built, there would be only half the property taxes paid and therefore only half of the amount paid back to the developer. That's inherent in the in the risk analysis here. Or if the building is worth, you know, it's assumed to be worth um, $12 million. Well, if the assessor says it's only worth $8 million when it's done, again, it will generate less obligation for the city to pay back. And in the, in the flip side, if, it's, if, if it generates more value, it'll be paid back sooner. And that's all inherent in the tax increment that's generated from whatever assessment is created. And s s so if... Yes, Katie. If okay. the project <clears throat> isn't going to happen at 80%, what is our... What, what is our risk of giving the 90% approval? Uh, the risk is less money going back to the general improvements in the overall tax increment district five in this case. So what Bill mentioned earlier in the finance committee meeting was we're trying to seek enough funds to support the public improvements that are related directly to that development. Uh, the reconstruction of Parmenter Street, for example, that was approved by the council just a few weeks ago. Uh, so that's one. Uh, also, there's the concern that Mark expressed at the Finance Committee of TID-5 um, being above water in terms of overall debt service over time. And so we're trying to capture more money for TID-5 relative to the project so that we can get to that point. All TIF districts start out in the hole. You have to borrow funds to begin with to get things going. And gradually, as you get the development, it uh, starts to pay back. Unfortunately, this TIF district started in the depths of the recession in 2009. And so we got off to a very slow start because people weren't building projects at that time. And uh, so that's one of the concerns. We do, on the bright side, we have another 15, 16 years of, uh, well, through 2036. So we have plenty of time as TIF districts go to make up that uh, current deficit in TID-5. So when people say it's underwater, it's a matter of perspective. TID-3 started off underwater by the time 
Uh, I was hired here, it was about even, and, and that was, it took about seven or eight years in a good economy for, that, for us to get to that point. And now you can see it, TID 3 is doing exceptionally well. So, Mike, if you remember, how was it that did we give, uh, what percent of the TIF we, did we give to the businesses at that time? If it depended have. on the project. There was no standard dollar amount. It, it depended upon uh, the but for test, you know, mm -hmm. but for TIF, would this project happen with a certain amount of funding? So we have totally supported some projects with 100% mm -hmm. TIF increment, and then others that uh, needed less assistance got less. I see. So maybe, Bill, are you, who pays for the, how do we cover about the, all the services in the TIF area? Like, for example, TIF 5, police, fire, EMS, and trash, all of those things. Is that covered by the general funds then? That's usually a general obligation. Um, of the city for services, uh, but as you as you recall, we uh, uh, utilize TIF to help offset some of those costs directly in uh, in TID three, mm -hmm. and we're paying that back gradually over time. In TIF three, we have a lot of money we can do it. So yes, uh, yes, Susan. Uh, I'm curious to know for workforce housing in TID 3, what percentage of the increment was provided <coughs> for the workforce housing projects? I've got. Passed. I, uh, I pulled the numbers on Stagecoach um, in particular. Um, and Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong if I've got these numbers wrong, but we, got, we gave $1.6 million in TIF for 48 units. Does that sound right? It's 46 units. 46 units, okay. So then, if I'm doing the math correctly, let me just pull this up real quick. So, divided by 46. So about 34,000 per unit, roughly, if you were to do that. If we were to, to do the full 90% um, that the developer is requesting, this project would be just shy of 32,000 per unit. So it would be cheaper than the TIF that we would do. It's not apples to apples, though. No. no. Build through all the interest. Jacob. You would need to speak in the mic. Sorry. But I'm actually asking about, is it Meadow Ridge, Jacob? Yeah, the, the, it's not apples to apples, though, to what you were saying, Luke. I'm going to drop this From down. Because Bill included all the capitalized interest in his number, I believe. Oh, okay. Right, Bill? I don't know which number you Like, the, you're saying the, your number was the 3.207, whatever it was. That includes, the that includes all the interest, whereas the, the 1.6 you're referring to... Does not. Does not, and I don't, like, I honestly don't even know what Bill, I, I, off the top of my head, what his number translates to as, like, the base, the, like, the, the actual base number. I, th I think it was, like, 2 point, was it, like, 2 point, 2 point, okay, I was going to say 2.3 something. But. but for Stagecoach, I don't think the whole 1.6 was. It wasn't for. No, there was, if I remember the numbers right, it was 700,000. Yes, Susan. You're, I would like to know for a yeah. I don't know what project number, like Meadow uh, yeah. it was it Me yeah, Meadow Ridge. Meadow Ridge. So what was the bill? Do you know what is uh, what kind of tip we gave for Meadow Ridge? It was two point one million, and it was all up front. It wasn't developer financed. And that is yeah. Okay. So that was actually more generous. I, I don't know. I didn't hear what you said, Susan. I'm sorry. So I, Susan said that was more generous. Is that true? I think it's 85. How many units are there in Meadow Ridge and how many units in Oak Ridge? Meadow Ridge is 95. Okay. Um, again, that was an upfront TIF. And then um, Oak Ridge was 83 units, and that was, uh, again, upfront. Um, and that was a uh, million five. So Bill Farm. For Meadow Ridge, it's one point, how much is 1.2 million, or what, what did you say, for 95 units? 2.1 million. Two. In Meadow Ridge uh, and Oak Ridge, they were both city financed, so we mm -hmm. borrowed money from a state trust fund loan and provided that up front. Meadow Ridge was 2.1 million, Oak Ridge was 1.5 million. Okay, okay, thank you. And I, I mean, I, I guess I'd throw it out there. I know I had mentioned this to Bill, um, you know, it obviously makes a huge difference in in the amount of, you know, the amount of TIF we're able to finance, 
with us having to pay a market rate. Uh, currently, I think it's about 5% today. I think we were at about 4.6 when we first started looking at this versus the, you know, the city can get the money for three. Um, you know, I personally, you know, we looked at it, you know, if it was an option, we'd be willing to take 80% of the TIF if, if the city wanted to go to the trust fund again and get the debt at 3% or whatever, whatever it is, because I think it gets us in, 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 in the same spot. You know, because obviously with interest rate being 150 basis points less for what you guys can get on debt or 100 and some points less than what we can get, that, that makes up that, that difference. Other questions? Yes, Emily. I, I just want to restate, as I have in the past, that I'm, I am for workforce housing. Um, I When I've knocked doors, I've met people who are working two to three jobs to make rent around here. There's not enough housing. People are moving in, and, and rates are going up, um, and we need supply. So if if we can't make it work at 90%, if he can't make it work at 90% and then nothing is being built, we're not helping the families that are already in the community. And I say that because my kids are at Sock Trail and I'm meeting these parents, I'm going on play dates, I'm seeing where they're living, and they are literally working two to three jobs. And, and I do appreciate that developers are trying and I understand the finances, but at the end of the day, we're the good neighbor city. And what are we doing? If you can't do it at 80 per, if, if you guys can explain to me the math, and I apologize, I missed part of the finance meeting, what is the difference between 80 and 90 percent? Why are we stuck here and why can't we help our neighbors? Uh, <laughs> it's four hundred eight thousand seven hundred ninety three dollars is the is the difference. That's what we're talking about. The issue part of the issue here we have is it, this thing came to us so late that we're we're at a deadline, which is not not the city's fault, not our fault. It, this also speaks to why we need to have a, a policy that we can look at because I am having a hard time moving up the percentage when I have staff who we hire and who we count on for their expertise to tell us, you know, this project warrants 80%. We have to look at each individual project to see what it warrants and they look at all of his financial information and that's what they come up with. I haven't had a chance to look at all that. Uh, as Mike says, part of it is we also want to get some increment into the district. But it's, it, you, have to, you have to understand that we, we can all agree that we want workforce out of it. I don't think you'd get anyone anywhere in the city of Middleton with a few exceptions that wouldn't want workforce housing. But we also have to look at it from a responsible financial point of view. And right now, staff is telling us 80%. Susan. I'd like to say, follow up on what Emily was saying. We have a tremendous shortage of housing. And in addition, what Luke was saying in terms of, we have many, many businesses that cannot find employees in the lower income sectors because they can't find a place to live. And so far, I don't know if there's another developer that's provided us with workforce housing, but I think it's been pretty much limited to Jacob. He builds incredibly nice houses or buildings and they become attractive. That will bring people in, and it will help our economy in terms of providing jobs for people. The, the restaurant right on the other side of here, Sofra, has stopped serving dinner because they couldn't find employees for the late night staffing. Um, we also have a problem of we have more jobs already in this city than residents. I'm talking about people between age one day and 120. So we are short of 
we have more jobs than we have people. We need workforce housing. I see this will also help spur development in Tribeca. And on a more global thing, having residents that live in the city and work in the city will be a big boon for helping on climate change. But we need to start thinking about. So if this project can't go forward at 80%, we need to provide it at 90%. So Susan, you said that people live and work here. Part of the problem is that uh, in workforce housing, we cannot really require that. People could be living on the, working on the east side of Madison and living here. So that's, uh, you know, it's a county-wide problem. So that's, that's a big issue. We cannot do that. So, I mean, You're from what I understand. You're saying a reason not to have workforce housing? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we, you know, you mentioned that uh, if we, we all would housing, like the people to live and work here, but we cannot require that people. I'm not saying want, that yeah. we're requiring. Okay, well, I if, just wanted to clarify that, so. Yeah. If we provide workforce housing, I have a feeling the majority will work here and not take a bus or drive to the east side of the city of Madison. So, Bill or somebody, do we have any data on that one? Or, Jacob, you have any data where in, in your units in either in uh, Meadow Ridge or uh, other one? Can you, can you, can you uh, please repeat the question? I don't know if the I The question is that uh, people living there, where, where do they work? Do they work in Middleton or somewhere um, else? So. You know, we always hire a, a, a company that, that does a market study. Um, we use Baker Tilly. It's a, like a local accounting firm, and they, they put together, you know, analysis of, um, you know, that's how we come up with how many units we think we can build at what, what different rent levels. Um, and they always uh, make, you know, they always kind of have it as a benchmark um, in their study that 85% of the people that will be living in, in the, the new building are already within the, the they call it PMA, which is the primary market area. And so I, I believe for, uh, for this project, our PMA basically goes, uh, I was just looking at this this morning. It's they're, they're like 190 pages. Um, I want to <laughs> I want to say that it, it basically goes uh, to Mineral Mineral Point, and then kind of over to Cross Plains, and then over um, to the to the lake basically. So, I, I you know our experiences, especially for seniors, are probably like 95 percent of them coming from the city. You know, on on a on a building like this, you probably have 80% of them like they use and and I think you know the goal is that you're bringing people in closer to their jobs I think that was the whole idea of, of TIF 5 was when we looked at what the goal was was to that TIF 3 had created so many jobs that TIF 5 was really set up originally um, to to support the people that were living uh, working at those jobs living there and like Mike said it's unfortunate I mean you know, Tribeca to this point has been an utter failure, right? They were supposed to have 250 million, 300 million or something in, in tax base already generated there. And I think if, if that would have been successful, we'd be having a completely different conversation today. But the economy changed, things happen like they do. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're ending, getting to the end of a very, uh, successful cycle in real estate here for the past, call it seven years, um, and so I think it's it's important to get projects like this uh, into the ground before that turns and we we look at another situation like like we had ten years ago. So I think now is the time that Tribeca needs a shot in the arm to to get things moving over there because they haven't, and I think when you see the catalytic effect that uh, Oak Ridge and Meadow Ridge had from where we put those to now there's going to be close to what 260 plus my 190 whatever that is 450 units of housing that are going to have been built there because I feel like m you know my company along with the city of Middleton trusting in me we took a risk there and it's paying off 
exponentially for, for the city and with that creating that core of, of people there, I mean, you're going to see all sorts of redevelopment now along Parmenter that if we wouldn't probably have gone out and taken the original risk, who knows where things would be at today. But I can tell you, you're adding that many people to an area, you know, retail's going to come. And, and so I don't I'm a firm believer that projects like this create momentum. Momentum creates new projects, which grows tax base, which creates people, which creates neighborhoods. And so, you know. Yes, Katie. Um, Jacob, what happens if, um, if we give you the 80 percent? If we get the 80 percent, uh, the project is not feasible or competitive, Duita. So you know, it's pretty, from our perspective, it's pointless to submit a project that we know doesn't score high enough to get credits. This is a very, you know, last year the cutoff was, uh, for these deals was 218 points. Um, I think we're basically at, I want to say 222 right now. So any, any, 222. So any any reduction in those points, i.e. points meaning like you you have to which yeah. money score back on your project. Yeah, so there's like 14 scoring categories, Got it. Um, and a couple of which we aren't we we don't compete in. Middleton doesn't have any qualified census tracts, meaning like low income census tracts so that that gets you five points. Um, you know, it, it scores high in the opportunity zones. It's got a great school district. Um, but without, if we, you know, if we give up four points, the, the project's not, I mean, it's, I've done enough of this. I've been doing this for 15 years. You know, we're three for three on Middleton deals. And I think since I've started my company, we missed one last year on a technicality, but I think we're four, four out of five or something like that. So we know we, you know, we work with SVA on, on their consult, you know, they do their consultant. They see all these, a lot of these deals that are in the state. We know where we got to be to be competitive and we're stretching it right now. And there's no other way to add points other ways if we do the 80? No, there's no other, no other way to, to grab any points. Um, we've completely maxed out. Everything is, a good chunk of the points are um, location related. Are you within a half mile of a bus stop? Sure. Are you within a mile of a grocery store? Are you within a mile of a senior center or a library? Or, and so a lot of these points are locationally fixed, you know. And then and then there's a, a financial leveraging category, which is where the the amount of um, outside sources that you're able to put into the deal to lessen the amounts of credits that you're using. Um, that's where that comes into play. So. And you said getting 80 percent, it's going to drop you four points. Yeah. And the and the line, the cutoff line for points to get WIDA find, uh, help is. Well, last year it was 218, which is a little bit skewed because we got bounced on a technicality. Uh, it, it's a long story, but yeah. It, it, if our deal would have got funded last year, the cutoff would have been about 221. But that's where you'd be with 80 percent, right? The 218? Yeah. Okay. So you need to have more points to win? I'm saying, yeah, we're going to have to be at least 222. Because last year, if we wouldn't have got our deal bounced, the cutoff would have been 221 or 222. So, but you are still, with the 80%, you are still going to go. I mean, you're not going to not submit it because, I mean, well, as a developer, you're going to have to, you're going to go ahead with, and submit it to Vida, right? No, we were actually talking about that. I Right now, we've got... Uh, uh, an, another project uh, in the city of Madison, uh, we're going to acquire and, and redevelop Westgate Mall. And so um, if this doesn't work out, we'd have some strong conversations about whether or not we're going to try and throw in a, a project there. So, Bill, um, so let's say if we were to borrow the state funds, so that's a higher risk for the city. and. Uh, like what we did for the other two projects, what would that mean? And also, what does it mean to the city, 80% versus 
Uh, yeah, for the state trust fund loan, currently the interest rate for this term is 3.75, not 3%. Uh, if the city were to borrow, that's considered a general obligation of the city. So that counts as our debt, counts against our debt limit, and that's something that Moody's looks at when they're evaluating the overall level of debt service with the city. Um, because of our high equalized value, we do have a lot of capacity be available. I think it's more a question of how much debt we want outstanding and how Moody's and rating agencies would look at the amount of debt we're holding. And in particular, knowing that we potentially have larger city projects coming in the future, depending on what happens with the community campus discussion. Uh, as Mike explained earlier, uh, there's always going to be more risk if the city <coughs> is borrowing the funds up front. Uh, there are things you can try to do to mitigate the risk, like having the ability to specially assess if there's a default in payments coming back from the development. Uh, but the city's definitely in a stronger position with less risk if you're doing developer financed. Uh, given the amount of debt that we have and that we've done state trust fund loans on a couple other projects that we'll be paying out for many years, my recommendation would be if there's an interest in doing something would be to go to the 90 percent before going to doing a state trust fund loan for the project so what is uh, what is the implication to the city of 80 percent versus 90 percent and it's it, 430 400 it, Plus yeah, it's, thousand dollars, it's, so. it's a difference of about four hundred thousand um, dollars over the life of the payments extending over the life of the tiff district and just wanted to reiterate that staff is supportive of this project um, and, and sees a benefit to it. Um, in putting our recommendation together, we were balancing uh, both the, the desirability of this project uh, with the desire to generate increment for other projects within TIF District Number 5. Um, there was a question of what happens if their approval is at 80 percent and if this project either doesn't score well or the developer doesn't decide to move forward with it. Um, you know, there would be the potential for another project there, which potentially would need less TIF assistance that would generate more increment. So I think that's part of the, the opportunity cost or the benefit uh, pros and cons that you're weighing of providing additional incentive for this project versus how much do we want to preserve on any project within TIF 5 going forward for other increment. And you don't have a lot of increment generators in TIF 5 right now. Yeah, I think you're right. And you have spent a lot of time on this one, tweaking, looking at the inflation, raising it from 1% to 2%. So, so you did raise uh, the total money which we will be giving to the developer. Is that true? I mean, you yeah, spent the, the developer's original request was for 100% of the increment. Mm -hmm. um, we initially were looking at 80%, but with a more conservative set of assumptions on the amount of increment that would be generated. Mm -hmm. uh, we were using uh, the prior year tax rate, which was lower, and we were using an annual inflation of 1% per year. Mm -hmm. um, that was projected to generate about $2.9 million over the life of the TIF district. Um, based on discussions with the developer and, and with the uh, city assessor, we've modified some of those assumptions, and we now have the updated tax rate that includes the higher um, school taxes with the referendum that was approved. And with those adjustments, um, still at the 80% level, um, that brings the total up to the 3270 So that added about 300000 from where we started. It's not as much as where the developer is as asking and saying that he needs to go forward. So we did add 300000 from the starting. Okay. Yeah. But in the, in the past, we've also had, uh, I believe we've used a 1.5% appreciation on the on the value of the building but also we increased the, the mill rate also went up one percent a year and here we were at two percent on the uh, appreciation but nothing on the mill rate so I I think it's still more conservative than than what we have done in the past for assumptions on value mark you had something so I I just want to remind everyone of, of a few observations um, the first is that I think it it's bare it bears it, it's worth repeating um, that TIF is not an entitlement a, every single project is subject to um, review and approval by the council so just because someone comes and asks for TIF whether it's 80 90 or 100 percent it is not an entitlement and we do not have to say yes to to all these projects. The second thing, and I wanted to just um, add on to what Bill was, was suggesting, is that 
as for as much as everybody wants to see workforce housing in this particular case because it is TIF 5 we need to balance that against our fiduciary responsibility as stewards of TIF 5 right and if we're approving projects that don't create increment or, or accrue increment to um, the TIF in general then that puts us in a bad situation in terms of other projects. We've got potential um, projects for Donna Drive uh, coming up. There's, we talked about specifically about uh, Parmenter Street reconstruction. I'll remind everyone that there is a million and a half to two million dollars that, that's sitting on the books for a bike trail, right? And if we start spending all the available increment on these projects, we won't have those funds to do the things that you've already expressed a desire to do, right? So we need to make sure that just because we've got this big, bright, shiny object called workforce housing, that doesn't skew our responsibility to be careful stewards of TIF 5 in general. So I think we just need to make sure that you know, if staff is saying that 80% is probably what we should do, we need to give that an undue amount of weight in our considerations. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Luke, you were going to say something? I, I okay. Said. Yeah, Emily. I hear you, Mark, and I appreciate it. I do. I, I think it's very important to be mindful of our tax dollars. Um, However, when I lived in Ohio, I lived near a t district, and I can tell you I lived literally on the edge. And the, the vacant lot sat there for the five years we lived there. And you know what? Nothing moved in. Be because no buildings moved in, no restaurants moved in, no shops moved in. Now we kept going towards the city core, and we spent all our money five blocks in the other direction. And the reason I say that is when I drive over towards Tribeca, you got some empty land out there. So if you don't do some engine starting things, it's not going to fulfill its prophecy. And that's the economic impact. When people live somewhere and they start spending money, then there's demand, the supply will follow. And, and I really do think if, if you're looking at it from this perspective and you're balancing it back and forth, yeah, I do want the bike path. But at the same time, if, if we've got vacant land that could be developed and become that engine that could, I think it's an opportunity to consider. I understand what you're saying, but remember that the way that deal, this deal is structured is that no dollar from increment can be used for any other purpose, right? So what's more powerful as an, an economic driver engine here, having a project that puts, say, 50% of its increment towards the total project or one that only puts 10%, right? With more increment going towards the project itself, that provides more of an impetus for additional economic growth than just a 10%. So it's a matter of scale. And I would argue that even, I don't want to disparage your Ohio residency, but I think. <laughs> I was a hipster youth, go on. But I think people would easily tell you that the, the economic outlook for Middleton is probably much more significantly higher than it was from where you live in Ohio, right? That's what we've been told. That's what this press has been for the last my entire residency here, 15 years. Middleton's the place to be. TIF is what's going to get us there. So I just think, you know, we need to be very careful that as we make these decisions regarding any investment in TIF, that they have a generation aspect to it that, that's going to help us build increment that's available for future economic growth and not to be sucked up in a single project. 
Uh, yes, Kathy and then Susan. Um, this, you're saying that Tribeca is there and it's been vacant for so long. There are other projects that are moving forward out there, not just this project. Is that correct? I mean, there's a lot of interest. There's getting to be more interest out there. Abby, you want to address that? There's, I think, one really new big one coming there, so. T-Wall has three multifamily buildings um, that have already been constructed in Tribeca, and there is a proposal. Um, it's called Graber View Senior Housing. Um, it includes independent living, assisted living, and memory care units, and it's a total of 100 units. So um, the, the project that Jacob's working on, 3810, is on the south side of Tribeca Drive, extended just west of Parmenter. Graber View is on the north side of Tribeca Drive, extended just west of Parmenter. And they have, um, let's see, I, I gotta keep track of where they are in their rezoning. I think that they have a recommendation for their SIP that's already been approved by Plan Commission. I can't remember if it's been before Council or not. So there are projects that's moving forward. So it's not, not like okay. this is just the only thing that's gonna be happening out there. Um, I'm just wondering that the, the amount that goes back, the increment applied to TIF, the TIF district, that has to stay and that's for the, that's for building infrastructure and whatnot. We have, I'm just kind of curious of public services to this building. Um, I remember Chuck saying, you know, we keep a, approving apartments, but we have to kind of weigh that against what we're doing for public safety. And how do you, how will this average out for that part of it? I don't know if I know what you're asking me. Let me try. I, I think the answer is if you were, what we're doing with TIV 3 is that we were claiming a recovery fee for those ser city services mm -hmm. that we're not entitled to under the TIF rules. Right, so this isn't the same thing. We don't have any recovery system for TIF 5. So essentially, any, any building is being subsidized by the general fund for those public services until the TIF closes. Until the TIF closes. Mm -hmm. Which is 2036. Susan. Okay. Uh, Kathy, are you done? Mm -hmm. Okay, Susan. Yeah, I agree with what Emily was saying, and I think we already have an example of with Meadow Ridge, Oak Ridge, we, Jacob built those. Then we got the Middleton <coughs> Market traced a, I don't know what the final name is, that coming in. That's an example of having two buildings there and we now have a building going into some empty baseball fields. Tribeca's been there it was proposed when I first got on council and nothing has happened to it other than we had some apartment buildings. But the more people we get there, it will induce buildings of retail and business. And I can give you a real good example of where that happened. It was Middleton Hills where we had houses and the front part of that stayed vacant for a long time, it was a forest or wooded area. We finally got the grocery store. We now have restaurants, multiple businesses. Every single place is now rented and filled up. But it took having those 400 houses surrounding it to get that in there. We need the people first, then it will get built up. Something else to say, this is not like TID 3 where most of the area requires a lot of money being provided for poor soils. Don't need that in this part of TID 5. <coughs> That's not really an issue in most of TID 5. Is that really true? I mean, we just gave a... That was in TID 3 for the hotel. Mm, okay. This is TID 5 going north from basically the roundabout north has good soils, and then down to Allen Boulevard. There's some spots down on Allen Boulevard if we redeveloped 
uh, Middleton Springs, we might need, we would need money, but that's, I don't think on our list of, it's not likely to happen soon. So I, I agree with Emily, this will bring in the businesses that Tribeca was originally planned for. And you know, not only retail, but actual businesses. I really strongly support this. And we do have an obligation to provide workforce housing. So Bill, Susan mentioned that uh, Dwell, what kind of tip we gave them? I know it's, originally it was 50%, right? In the end, it was 70%? Yeah, it's 70%. Okay, okay. Or what? Yeah, uh, that uh, you well, mentioned that. Uh, the new apartment complex. The Tracer. Complex is going yeah, to the new market. apartment oh. complex at the baseball field, so. Yeah. It's going by 12. 12, mm -hmm. okay. But it's also not workforce housing. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Robert. Probably going to show my stupidity here, but is there any way that splitting the difference gets us, gets you really close to what you need, gets people happy, and the number is 85% would be halfway in between. I have to ask the question. I'll start with, with you, Jacob. What, what does that do to your credits or points or whatever your system is? Um. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the you know, we'd have to look at it. Um, as it was, we were deferring half the fee on on the four percent deal and over a third on the other. Um, so, you know, I don't really see that there's any room to take on the amount of risk that we have over the next 12 months before we start construction, because I'm not, you know, you would need to kind of be, <laughs> the, the answer is no, I mean, but it's like, you, to start doing that, you like almost have to have this like huge look back, right? Like if I take the risk on the 12 months, if I say, yeah, I'll take 85%, but then we gotta look at it 12 months from now and, and make it whole, you guys don't wanna take that risk, right? You know, because we're building in some factor of, of contingency, right, that things are going to change over a 12-month period. I take the risk on that, that it goes one way, you know, without being able to, to come back. I mean, we're not the type of, you know, we've now done, what, four deals here. You don't see us coming back in asking for money for improvements to build out my retail space. We don't do that, you know? So that's a difference. Um, you know, we, so short answer, you know, we could look at it, but my gut feeling is based on the numbers we've got, 90% is what we need. You know, I don't think we're really, the city's not really taking any risk. We're, we're financing it where we have in the past. It's, I think it's really tough to, um, you know, to count, we're counting on a million dollars of county, county funds in our capital stack. You know, I think that that's, also a pretty aggressive assumption, but I think that we, we've had success with that program in the past. I think that this project scores well for that, and so I'm, I'm counting on that million. Um, so really, no, the 90 is what we need to do. So Robert, he said he will look at it. Is that, you want to make that motion then? I guess that's uh, a good compromise. Would it change anybody's vote? I mean, it, I don't know, but it, it, it makes a difference. It's a good try. It's a good try. Yeah. You want to make that motion? No. Okay. So I have a question mm -hmm. for Larry. There was a motion and a second for one number in an alternate motion. Which one takes priority? Which one gets voted? The, moment, the substitute motion. Alternate. <clears throat> okay, any other questions or comments? So we will be voting on the alternate motion. That is, uh, the staff recommendation is 80%, and this, uh, this motion is uh, giving the 90% F. So, so we are voting on that motion. So if you... We're voting on 80 or 90? 90. 90%. 90. So if you say yes, so that means 90%. Can I just ask one more question of Abby? 
Okay. When you're coming up with the percentages, how how certain are you of this number versus the 90? What do you, how do you come up with these numbers? Actually, Bill may have, well, they both have, let's give both a chance. Probably do a better job answering it. You can go ahead. You know, while, he, he's, while he's, he's prepping, person, so. I, I am going to respond to your question, by the way. Columbus is one of the three metro areas growing in the Midwest. And when I lived in Columbus, they had a wonderful African-American middle class. And opportunities come in different ways. So please consider those things. Go ahead. Yes, Bill. And then Abby, uh, or both. I, yeah, I, I guess to, to start, I, I am not an expert in WIDA scoring and, and how the points and all that will work. Um, as I said, you know, when we put the recommendation together, we were trying to balance um, supporting a very favorable project with the goal of trying to generate um, a significant amount of increment or at least a, a good portion of increment for the benefit of the overall TID. Um, there was some back and forth with the developer. Um, they originally were proposing uh, doing two 4% projects that did not, that had higher income levels than what they're currently having with one 4% project and one 9% project. Um, by adding in the 9% project, that added in some additional tax credit revenue. <coughs> um, as part of that process, the developer also showed increased um, costs and they bumped up the interest rate and they were trying to build in some uh, I'd say more conservative assumptions on their side, knowing that there is this risk that costs could go up over the next year. Uh, we asked questions for why those changes were made. I understand the explanation from the developer. Uh, we ended up using their updated cost numbers, and we also, as I had mentioned, used the higher inflation rate and the higher tax rate, um, trying to meet somewhere in the middle. The developer still indicated that that's not enough to move the project forward. I can't evaluate whether or not that's true with the, the WIDA scoring. Um, you know, we felt that we did what we could from trying to stay at an 80% what are reasonable assumptions that would still provide a sizable um, upfront paid development fee of about $2 million or 8.5% of the project. Uh, you know, again, I can't say whether or not that's enough to move the project forward or not, and I certainly understand there's two conflicting policy goals here. And that's kind but of the 80% is based is. on the high, higher numbers that the developer gave you? Um, higher than in, in what our, he originally gave. So. In, in our uh, analysis of the 80%, we use the higher cost numbers. I think the main difference is, is that the 80% would not support a full 10% upfront paid developer fee. And that's the number the developer is trying to get to, is my understanding. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jacob. So, Kathy, to answer your question, they did add three hundred thousand dollars to the original eighty percent. Eighty percent is part of that. Yeah, yeah. By that adding, is part of the eighty percent, I should say. Yes, but the eighty percent which they had to begin with is much larger number now after using those other figures. So it's uh, three hundred thousand dollars more than before. So. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so the. If motion is to approve the 90% TIF for the developer and the staff recommendation is 80%. So if you vote uh, yes, you are voting for 90%. If you vote no, you are voting, well, you are voting against it. So That's right. all those in uh, favor of the motion to uh, grant TIF at 90% level say aye. 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 Okay, so how many? Uh, well, let's do a post too. Well, the roll call vote, please. Okay, yeah. let's go with the roll call. Roll call, please. Ramsey. No. Sullivan. No. Nelson. No. Moon. Yes. Lazard. Yes. West. Yes. Olson. No. Burke. Okay, so the motion fails. So now we go to the alternate motion. That is to... The original motion, yeah. Uh, well, go to the original motion. Any questions or comments on that motion? All those in favor of the motion to approve 80% if as recommended by the staff to the developer say yes. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Nay. 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 So f looks like 5-3, right? Roll call. Roll call. Oh, okay. roll call. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Ramsey. Yes. 
Sullivan? Yes. Nelson? No. Kuhn? No. Zard? No. West? No. Olson? Yes. Kirk? Yes. No, it's 4-4. Four, four. Four. I'm going to go with the staff, and yes. Okay. It's a hard decision, but the staff already raised from what 80% was by $300,000. It was his original 90% uh, clearly, so. Okay, we are on to the, so Jacob, work hard on this and make it happen, so. <laughs> okay, resolution 2019-41, University Avenue, Cayuga Park, reconstruction. Fire station sidewalk easement is passed by all various committees at various times. <coughs> Need a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. Need a second? Second. Okay. So any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Item number two. 2019-46, granting an easement to MGNE for new electric service at water utility well number four. So it just does, I guess you read the comments, they just want to put some equipment there and they need easement, so. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, any questions or comments? Anybody want to say more or? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve say aye. Aye. Can you one post so the motion passes? Need a motion to adjourn? Move. Need a second? Okay, so all those in favor say aye. Aye. So we are adjourned. <laughs>